Well, the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to be partnering with Peter Dunn, also known as Pete the Planner, um, to talk about financial wellness. As most of you know, financial wellness is a vital part of the Apex Healthy Connects model, as you can see. Um, just to let you all know, all lines have been muted. Um, and if you have a question, please use the chat or question feature um, within the webinar. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce Peter Dunn, our guest speaker. Um, he's an award-winning comedian and an award-winning financial mind. He's written three books, What Your Dad Never Taught You About Budgeting, 60 Days to Change, and How to Avoid Student Loans. He hosts the popular radio show, Pete the Planner Show on WIBC-FM, and Pete appears regularly on the Indianapolis affiliate Fox 59 as their personal finance expert, as well as nationally on Fox News. Pete was named one of Indy's best and brightest in finance in 2007, media in 2009 by KPMG, and declared one of Nouveau Magazine's 30 Under 30 to watch in the arts for comedy. So after that lengthy introduction, Pete, welcome and thanks so much for joining us. We'll go ahead and share your screen, and we'll go ahead and let you get started. Thanks again for being here. All right, uh, so we're all ready to go. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you all taking time out of your busy mornings. Uh, it's been my experience that human resource professionals and wellness experts typically are the Swiss Army Knights of the organizations they work for. And so I know that uh, learning a new skill or some new ideas today is not only important for your job, but also very required by the organizations you serve. Uh, today we're going to talk about a, a topic that gets a lot of buzz in the wellness space and the HR space. And I want you to understand it um, from, from my perspective. We've worked in this space as long as anybody has. Uh, today is not an attempt in any way, shape, or form to get you to use our services. I want you to walk away knowing everything you need to know. So don't. this is not a sales pitch. And the mere disclaimer hopefully is enough to convince you of that, uh, if not my next hour of presenting. Uh, so again, I do a lot of work for Fox News, CNN, uh, a radio show, I have the Indianapolis Star. I study money. I travel the country and talk about money and people's behaviors. And we started to cross over, or we have crossed over, and understanding people's financial behaviors in the workplace. Uh, here's a small clip of what I do on a regular basis. today or that you think of later, by all means find me on Twitter. I'm on there all the time to the dismay of my wife, uh, at Pete the Planner. And you can always check in to see what my mom's talking about uh, on Facebook by going to my Pete the Planner page on Facebook because she's commenting on everything I do for my dad's account because she's locked out of her six accounts that she started. So enjoy that. Um, so I, today we kind of have to have an honest conversation. I know we try to take away the biases that we have personally uh, towards um, financial issues. But in order for us to make any progress today, I'm going to be as blunt and honest as I can be. And, I, and we do have a few ground rules that will make this easier that we can play by. Uh, number one, uh, people who are in tough financial situations are not bad people. Uh, you're a professional. You realize that. You know that. But the reality of the situation is uh, oftentimes when we try to fix people with financial issues, um, some people deem them as, uh, trouble or problem, and that's just not the case. Number two is we're not necessarily suggesting you should dig into the financial lives of potential hires or uh, your employees. Financial wellness is not about being nosy, as you'll learn here in a little bit. It's really about uh, assisting people when they need to be assisted. 
And finally, uh, we're primarily addressing problems created through behavior, not circumstance. So there's two types of financial issues. Those created by behavior, which I believe to be the number one reason for people's financial troubles, and those simply created by circumstance. I think we can uh, unanimously agree that if someone's having financial trouble uh, because of a change in marital status or you know, the death of a loved one or a job loss, I think we can all agree that in many instances that was avoid that was unavoidable and that there's nothing really someone can do to have mitigated that situation. But that being said, financial wellness is meant to be there to catch someone when they are struggling. I want to start off with just a brief story of something that happened last year. I did a uh, what we called extreme financial makeovers for 10 employees nationwide of a company we work for. And the point was to fly out to whatever city they're in and for 48 hours do an extreme financial makeover on their life. Well, I did this to a guy and his wife in uh, Moore, Oklahoma. It basically, no offense to Moore, Oklahoma, it really is the middle of nowhere. I'm pretty sure their town sign said, welcome to the middle of nowhere, because it was the middle of nowhere. And we were uh, going through this financial life, and I had done that thousands of times before, and something wasn't right. Something wasn't adding up, and I could not put my finger on it. So the drive back to the airport and the flight home, the whole time I thought, something's not right, something's not making sense. About three weeks later, the guy called me and said, uh, Pete, I haven't worked since you left. Uh, found out my wife had been having an affair, and the reason why things were struggling is because she was cashing her paychecks, and that's why the numbers were matching up. And he goes, I'm the sales leader, the manager in my region, and basically the entire state of Oklahoma sales for our company has been shut down for the last three weeks because I'm freaking out and can't work and financially can't make it. The point of financial wellness is to catch someone when they're in this situation. It's to, to make sure we can put a plan in place, a budget in place. Although that is clearly a family issue, it really is a financial issue. Not only for the employee, but it's also the financial issue for the company that missed out on a ton of revenue while I was dealing with a, an affair that his wife was having. So let's uh, let's let's understand this, that if you don't have a financial wellness plan in place, this picture you see on the screen is actually your financial wellness strategy. What you're saying is, man, I hope people don't have financial problems. But what I think you'll see is a lot of people have financial issues, and with just connecting the dots for them, it can make a huge difference. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, I created two scenarios just to kind of illustrate the beliefs you really do have deep down inside about financial wellness that you may not realize. Uh, we have two candidates. Of course, I made up their names, so I took the liberties to call him something ridiculous. So this is Cornelius Longbeard. I don't know. I get very bored and I'm very sorry for this. But candidate A, Cornelius Longbeard, 15 years of experience. He's proficient in whatever relevant technology you're looking for uh, in a new hire. He's previously worked for a great company, maybe a competitor where you'd like to, to tap his knowledge base. Uh, excellent references and on very, very solid financial ground. Now, by the way, uh, you have to understand, you didn't ask him if he was on solid financial ground. This is my this is my hypothetical example. So you have to give me the liberties to realize that like a magical fairy came by and, and zapped you with the information. So you just happen to know that he's on very solid solid financial ground. Now candidate B, uh, Captain Tim Sprinkles, again, I, I'm a very bored individual, I'm very sorry for the name. Uh, exact same experience. Exact, exact same resume. The only differentiation is that same fairy came by and you happen to find out that Captain Tim Sprinkles, despite his uh, accreditations as a captain, uh, is a financial disaster in every single way. Okay, so what I'm asking you right now is a really uncomfortable question. And unfortunately, everyone's on mute, so you don't hear anyone uh, squirming in their chair. Uh, who would you hire, A or B? Who would you hire, A or B? Now, I'm telling you again, this isn't about that Captain Tim Sprinkles is a bad person. This is, would you want someone who is very qualified and has a, shown a good job of um, taking advantage of their own personal financial resources, or do you want someone who's very qualified that has shown a, a poor job of doing well with their financial resources? So here's the harsh realities of people that struggle with, with uh, financial issues. Uh, number one, there are stress-related health issues. Uh, and those are numerous. Uh, anxiety, depression, to name a few. 
um, even to the point of, of heart disease, some of the bigger issues that really get to uh, increasing healthcare costs within your organization. The second is obvious, it's productivity. We did a study a couple of years ago. This is a real study, by the way, because I find that most statistics are made up. I find that like 80% of statistics are made up and the other 45% are inaccurate. But uh, this is a real statistic. 90%, 90% of your employees, of everyone, checks their checking account balance at work. Now, do you care, do I care about the 30 seconds it takes to check your checking account balance? No, of course not. But the information you gather and what you do with that information over the next half hour to hour it becomes an issue. I mean, when you when you check your balance, you're checking it for a reason so you can react or feel or adjust. Do you think in 1985 that people woke up to start their 80s day and ran to their check register and check their check account balance? No, of course not. Do you think midday in the 80s someone turned around from their giant computer monitor and checked their check register to find their check account balance? No, of course not. Yet there were better savings rates and there were lower debt ratios in 1985 than there were today. What's really interesting is not only is checking your checking account balance a poor financial tool and actually a crutch that hurts people, but secondly, it, it creates a lack of productivity or a lack of productivity and it, and it creates some serious issues there. Presenteeism, that's one of those terms that I wish I invented, but I was it happened way too soon for me. It's a brilliant thing. It's where you're physically there but not mentally there. I'll tell you, uh, if you're struggling financially, I mean, just think about sitting down at the dinner table when you're stressed out financially. You can't even hear what your spouse or your kids are saying because all you're thinking about is, is uh, financial stress-related issues. Crossover skills and judgment. Here's a, here's a slightly uncomfortable one. I'm willing to say, because I have the data to back it up, the people that have proven to make terrible financial decisions in their own lives will make poor financial decisions for the organizations they, they serve. No one wants to admit that. We all have a member, and I have uh, a member of our organizations. We have these people that are loving, wonderful family members for our organization. They're hard workers, they've done a good job, but if they have financial issues, if they've made financial mistakes, the reality is they're more likely to make similar mistakes in the roles they're in, whether they have in the past or not. Garnishments, this is a, a tricky one that people really don't get a grasp on, and I want to spend a couple minutes on it. So as you know, a garnishment, or maybe you don't know, is um, a structured draw from someone's income ordered by a court or another authority. Uh, they would child support, they haven't paid their credit card bill, something like that, and a garnishment becomes uh, a necessary ruling. This is where you reduce their income and pay the judgment. Now here's the issue with this. If you happen to have a workforce with garnishments, please understand that this is a major financial wellness issue. Your employee has stopped working for themselves. They've stopped working hard so that they can earn money to take home and accomplish their financial goals and live their financial lives. By judgment, someone that they disagree with, generally vehemently, is getting, I don't know, a third of their income. That affects morale, it affects productivity, and it affects their financial lives. So you need a strategy to help these people deal with the garnishments in a respectful way. If you don't have one, you're missing an opportunity to improve that person's life. Oh, and by the way, increase productivity and improve the bottom line. That's an uncomfortable topic, by the way. I should have a horn every time you talk about something uncomfortable, I can just honk the horn, which would be the entire hour, right? Yes. Uh, pushing the raise schedule, I think, is an interesting one. How many times have you had someone come to you and say, hey, uh, I'd like a raise? And you say, why? And then they come up with reasons how they've done a good job for the company, but ultimately it's because they need more money. Now, this is a controversial statement. It's appropriate, it's just controversial. Is um, you know, you give someone that's not very resourceful more resources and they'll simply waste them. So sometimes when you give someone a raise because they can't handle the resources they have, you're just throwing your money away. And in some ways you're enabling their poor behavior. I hate cliches and I, you know, I, I hate old sayings, but I'll tell you, uh, the old give a man to fish he eats for a day or teach a man to fish he eats for a lifetime thing could not be any truer than it is in financial wellness. 
if you give someone a $1,000 bonus without addressing any financial bills that they have, in many ways, you'd be better served to teach them how to deal with the money that they currently earn. Uh, everyone thinks that more money solves problems, but I'll tell you, less spending often is the proper solution. And finally, 401k loans. I'm, I'm honking that uncomfortable topic for them again. Uh, 401k loans are, are interesting because in many ways, as benefit administrators, we can control what happens there. Uh, I've never seen a 401k loan that's really made sense. People that take them out are more likely to take out another one. People fund all sorts of stuff. Is it their money? Absolutely. Do they have a right to it? Yeah, absolutely. But I think as a leader, as, as a cultural leader within your organization, and hopefully a financial leader within your organization, you know how, how hurtful this is for people. Uh, desperate times call for desperate measures, but I'll tell you what, when people start dipping into their 401k for no particular reason, or reasons that, that objectively from the outside aren't that great, it's not your fault as a benefits administrator, but I'll tell you, you can do something to stop it. In the next slide here, stand by. There we go. All right, so we are going to play a little game I like to call, would you be interested in hiring uh, this person? So it's a very uncomfortable game. It's kind of a, uh, a game show. Would you be interested in hiring this person? So here goes the uncomfortable form being haunted again. Would you be interested in hiring someone that isn't resourceful with company funds? Okay. Would you be interested in hiring someone that doesn't pay vendors on time? Would you be interested in hiring someone that communicates poorly with coworkers in regards to money? Would you be interested in hiring someone that refuses to follow your company's budget? And here's the bonus round. When I do this presentation live, by the way, we have game show music and it's fantastic. Here's the bonus round. Uh, would you be interested, uh, or do you believe most people care more about their own personal financial success or their employer's financial success? Most people care more, and by most I mean all, care more about their own personal financial success than they, uh, than they care about the success of the place where they work. So if people have demonstrated the ability to communicate poorly with their spouses about money, to go over budget, to not pay bills on time, and to not respect financial guidelines of their home life. There's no motivation to actually do that in the workplace, and that's why we address these things. Uh, and so it, it, to me, it boils down to this. We almost unanimously agree. There's one of you holding out. I can feel it. I can feel it in the force. But there's one of you holding out that but everyone else thinks that uh, we would prefer to have financially well people in the workforce. We really would. And so in that one example where we had two candidates, if we were going to hire the, the financially well person, then why not create the financially well people within our organizations? And this is the heart of financial wellness. We just said that it increases productivity, decreases presenteeism, decreases uh, stress-related issues, and the like. So why not put a program in place to address those things and kind of cut them off at the pass? One of the companies I work with is called Defender Direct based out of Indianapolis, and they've got a really, really, really interesting culture. In fact, traveling the country, I've, I've yet to see anything else like it. And their corporate motto, which, believe me, they bleed every day, is businesses don't grow, people do. And uh, to be honest with you, that's what financial wellness is about. If you're going to help people improve their lives with, with the resources they're given by the company, then ultimately they'll help the company as well. What's really interesting is most people, the anecdote, most people think I want to work hard at work so I can make more money and improve my financial life. Okay, so just by a show of nodded heads, who agrees with that? I can't see any of you. Uh, but I would disagree with that statement. I think actually people will have a better career if they fix their financial life. I think people are more grounded. I think people will have just a better sense of resources if they're not pressing. You know, we'll talk about you know, your, your sales force here in a minute, but think about your best salesperson, your best revenue producing 
uh, individual at your company, think if they're struggling financially and they start pressing on their sales. They start calculating their commission in their head as they're, as they're at the table because they need it so bad. That's not good for you and it's not good for the organization, but if they're at financial peace, if they're in a good place, then they'll do a better job. Now, I have a video on here that I was going to show, but we can go without it. I think the way the last one lagged, uh, it probably is best to not do it. You can see this video uh, at PeteThePlanner.com slash workplace, all one word, and uh, Cassie will send out uh, that email. So I'm going to skip that video, but here's the thing. It's a lovely video. You want to see it. Fifty-five percent of people in 2012 uh, break even or have a shortage on a monthly basis. This means over half of people spend more than they make or simply break even every single month. Fifty-six percent of people don't have a penny saved. Now this is important because life happens. Uh, life happens, and if you rear-end someone on the way to work, just the smallest vendor bender of $200, $300 that would cost for your deductible or whatever, not that there's a $300 insurance deductible floating around out there, but let's just say it's $300. What's really nutty is if people aren't prepared for that, it can throw them into a tizzy for two years. A $200 expense when you're not prepared for can mess you up for two years. And a side note, by the way, I'm not selling this, it's just an interesting side note. We just developed a program that's free to the public, which we're launching in November, which is how anyone can save $465 in just 30 days. And the concept is, is, is brutally simple. We encourage people for a 30-day period on day one to transfer $1 from your checking account to your savings account, on day two to transfer $2, on day three to transfer three, and so on and so forth. And so it's a little bit of a structured program that you need to read to understand, but ultimately what we figured out is, based on how frequently people check their checking account balance, if we slowly rob them of their money over 30 days, and that money goes towards to build an emergency reserve, that they'll be able to handle it. I, again, anecdotally, I feel most people, no matter their pay level, waste at least $500 a month, uh, whether you're making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or you're making $40,000 a year. I find that to be the case, so that's neither here nor there. But it was here because I just brought it up. Uh, so let's create a plan to end uh, stress-related health issues, productivity issues, presenteeism issues, garnishments, pushing the raise schedule, and 401k loans. And I believe that to be financial wellness. That's the solution. And uh, we need to talk about what it isn't, though. We've got to talk about what it isn't. It is not investing. It is not investing in any way, shape, or form. And you have to understand this. Not only is it not your 401k administrator you're doing financial wellness, but it is not giving investment advice, and it shouldn't be. Anytime you're giving an investment advice in the workplace, you are subjecting yourself to a tremendous amount of risk and fiduciary responsibility. You know, think of all the, the programs, wellness programs, benefit programs that you poo-pooed in the past because you didn't want the liability that went along with it. Well, guess what? If you do financial wellness and involves investing in the workplace, you basically are juggling knives over your CEO why he's sleeping in bed, he or she is sleeping in bed. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Financial wellness also is uh, not nosy. That's a clip art picture of a person with a giant nose. That's how creative I am. Sorry. Uh, anyway, it's not nosy. Can you think about Think about health wellness, think about fitness, think about the biggest loser programs and, and promoting weight loss in the workplace and all the good things it does. On some level, whenever all that stuff started, I don't know, Casper, 10 years ago, here's what happened. And, and look, we've got to get comfortable with this because this is what happened. Someone decided it was not uncomfortable to say the following phrase. You know what? I'm a little bit chunky. You're a little bit chunky. Let's get less chunky together. Then no one freaked out. Right? I mean, no one's like, how dare you? It's like, thank you. I appreciate that. And that's right. You are chunky. That's what they said to me, of course. Uh, and in this sense of situation, what we're saying is uh, we could all stand to learn a little bit more financially, to be a little more efficient. Um, it's it just been our experience. Again, I, I speak to 275,000 people a year at this point uh, about financial wellness, both HR administrators and in the workplace. And I'll tell you, not at any point in time have we ever gotten the feedback or do any financial wellness program get the feedback of, 
this is none of your damn business. They never feel that way. And you're just going to have to take my word for that. And again, that has nothing to do with me. It has to do with any financial bonds program you look at. No one is ever going to come to you and say anything other than thank you. Uh, the other thing is, you need to understand, it's not dangerous. Financial wellness is not dangerous if, if uh, put in there correctly. Uh, we're teaching people how to budget. We're teaching people how to get out of debt. There's really no danger in that. If we're talking investing, yeah, there could be some dangers in that. Uh, but the reality is that it's, it's pretty simple stuff. That being said, this is a good time to discuss the difference, differences between financial literacy and financial wellness. Financial literacy is, in my opinion, for people that have zero baseline of understanding of mathematics or money in general. And I would say in most workplaces, that's not necessary to have financial literacy. Financial literacy also has no motivation component to it as well. Um, good financial wellness program needs to feel like your favorite high school teacher that you ever had. Okay, so think about this for a moment. Think about your favorite high school teacher, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. Put them in your head for a second, okay? It's nice to think about them every once in a while. Now, did you like them because they knew the subject? Eh, I mean, kind of, I'm sure they knew it. Who cares? I can think of mine. I don't even remember if they knew the subject very well. You liked it because they made it interesting, and they made it engaging, and you felt like a real person. When you shop for financial wellness uh, solutions, you have to understand that we basically, in financial wellness, are talking about root canals. We're talking about going into a conference room and saying, everyone open your face and we're going to pull your teeth out. And I'm being serious, I'm being honest with you. Yet there are great programs that do this elegantly and people love them. And there are other programs that do this that actually videotape the teeth being pulled out of their mouths and then show it at the Christmas party. And that's a problem. It needs to be motivated. You need people to understand that this is behavior, and that's it. So there's the danger that you bore people to death. So it is everything other than investing. It is uh, getting organized. Think about this. Think of your least organized coworker right now. Think of whoever it is. And by the way, if they happen to be sitting next to you in a conference room on this call, don't look at them because that's just rude. But think of your most disorganized coworker. What are the chances that they're financially well? Slim to none. Uh, of course, budgeting is part of this, credit and debt. Uh, all my sparkly images take a lot to load. Uh, we also have got major purchases, spending, and of course, risk management, uh, which is going to help explain some of the other supplemental benefits that you already have in place. Having a financial wellness expert explain why people need supplemental life insurance is actually a better idea than having uh, the supplemental life insurance people explain why you need supplemental life insurance. There's nothing quite like getting good advice from someone not trying to sell you something. Which we'll get to that in a moment as well. Uh, and saving, of course, saving, as you notice, is the last thing I bring up. And in my opinion, uh, it's one of the last bricks in the wall of financial wellness. I think so often we need to address everything else up on this screen other than saving before we even get to saving. So credit and debt, you know, there's workforces that we deal with, a lot of, you know, young tech company, highly compensated, highly intelligent individuals with ridiculous amounts of student loans. It's funny to talk to a CFO of a corporation and to, to get them to understand that the biggest threat within their organization are the copious amounts of student loans that exist. And so uh, we certainly help people understand student loans and how that impacts their organization. Uh, and by we, I mean the financial industry financial wellness industry. Uh, good credit and debt um, counseling is important too, but it's not from a credit score perspective. I personally believe credit scores are stupid. I think that they're, they're, they're not our score, they're not our metric. Uh, I, think I was speaking in Chicago earlier this year, and a guy came up to me and said, hey, I make $120,000. I was like, oh, that's a weird icebreaker. <laughs> and then he was like, no, I have a, I have a 785 point credit score, but I have $90,000 in credit card debt. I pay $4,000 a month in minimum payments. Because I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. And as stupid as it sounds, is every time I was about to do something that didn't seem right, I would just, I had a credit monitoring service. And I was just waiting for my score to go down or waiting for me to get declined. But every time I did something 
on the edge, my score went up. My score kept going up the more I borrowed. And he said, I just got addicted to the fact that I was building good credit despite the fact that I was struggling. Now, I'll be honest, that's an extreme example. It's a true example. It's extreme and it's really stupid. But I think on many levels, people feel some uh, degree of that feeling on, uh, on the spectrum of sort. Uh, that they misunderstand their credit. You know, when people come to me and say, well, I, hey, I have perfect credit. You know, I'll be honest, I don't care. I, I don't think that gives any measure of financial wellness. And good financial wellness program, you can sniff that out easily. I'll tell you, probably the top uh, two to five solutions that, that exist in the financial wellness marketplace, uh, they definitely understand that credit scores don't matter. Uh, I get really nervous when financial wellness programming consists of teaching people to improve their credit scores. That really, really bothers me. That's like if your financial, or your, pardon me, your health wellness program was the Atkins style. And, and to me, that makes no sense, right? You eat a ton of bacon, you eat a lot of cheese and beef, and guess what? The weight just falls off. And we're all intelligent people. Well, you guys are intelligent people. I might not be, but I can tell you this. Bacon is delicious, but eating it nonstop to lose weight is a horrific idea. And if you have a financial wellness program that focuses on improving credit scores, you're going to get bit. Because what's going to happen is, if you had to do stupid crap to raise your credit score. I refinanced my mortgage this spring. I got a letter from my bank that says, you have a 780, and by the way, if you want to improve that, take out three credit cards and pay off two. Which is stupid, right? I mean, we all know that that makes no sense. And why would I really want to do that? I have a 780. Budgeting. Man, budgeting is so misunderstood. Everyone hates budgeting. This is the root canal part, right? Uh, and, and that's okay. I think you need to teach budgeting, a financial loss program, the solutions you look for, you need to teach budgeting in a very real way. The reality of the situation is this. There is a technical answer to any financial problem. But technical answers are not what is needed. You need practical solutions. You need to teach budgeting that makes sense. Because we, we as in the financial industry, wellness industry, we don't want to come into someone and blow up all their habits and say, start from scratch with budgeting. What you've got to do is you've got to look at someone's habits, you've got to look at their behavior, and you've got to craft budgeting around that. Because then they're more likely to implement the solutions. Think that you're, you're bringing financial wellness in your workplace. You, you research companies, you spend money to bring them. Budgeting is taught. But if no one does anything, I mean, what's the point? Budgeting solutions, any financial wellness solution, you can't have the technical answer. You have to have very practical solutions that anyone within your organization can deal with. Which brings me to another side point. I specialize in the side point if you haven't figured this out. Is that financial wellness solutions uh, is important, especially if you have a split workforce. And what I mean by that is, uh, and I'm going to use pretty archaic terms here, and I apologize, uh, a blue collar workforce and a white collar workforce. If you have both, don't think that financial wellness is just for the blue collar people. In fact, I will tell you that a good financial wellness program will uh, account for the fact that they're both. They'll have programming that brings both people in the room at the same time. And then there's also programming that allows each part of your workforce to get what they need on demand uh, that doesn't embarrass or does not uh, discriminate or segregate your workforce. There's nothing more horrific than having a white-collar uh, financial wellness program in, the, in a meeting room by the blue collar workforce is, is powering away and then switching it out. That makes no sense. And so good financial wellness programming is going to be meaningful to both groups without insulting either group. All right, so if you promise not to tell this story, then I'm going to tell it to you. Um, a company we work with, prior to us getting there, their CFO decided to uh, have a workshop for home ownership in 2006. So he was a big believer in the American dream, as he puts it, and that home ownership is the solution to people's problems. And so he had put lots of people in his workforce personally through a workshop he wrote on how to buy a house. And uh, by the way, there's, there's a thousand things wrong with that. But here's the words. As of now, uh, fast forward seven years from when he did the workshop, 27 people in his organization have been subject to foreclosures. And all 27 were in this home buying program that we put people through. Home ownership is, is not only not for everyone, but it's, it's rarely uh, appropriate 
to talk about in the workplace. You need to encourage people to rent when they should rent. I may be one of the only financial experts on the planet that see no problem with renting. I don't think it's second place. I don't think it's some consolation prize. I think it's a really smart move. I had a caller to my radio show last year that, that called in or emailed in, pardon me, and said that um, he was having a debate with a coworker, that the coworker was ten thousand dollars upside down in his house, meaning that he owed ten thousand dollars more than it was worth, and had zero dollars in savings. But the emailer himself had sixty-three dollars to his name and was a renter. And the debate was who was in a better financial position. Well, it's funny to think that the person with the sixty-three dollar net worth is in a better financial position than a person with a negative ten thousand dollar net worth. Renting can make sense. And I think oftentimes when people jam themselves into specifically production homes and just trying to afford a home, there's a lot of times those are homes that don't hold value and then completely break the myth of home ownership as an investment. So there's some pointed home ownership comments for you. And I think you may have heard my stomach growl. Sorry about that. <laughs> Budgeting, of course, I, I, it's so important I put it in here twice, but I won't talk about it again. Uh, now, this is interesting. I wish I would have created this metaphor as well. And this is retirement in a nutshell. And by the way, if nothing else I've said today will make you sad, this is the sad making slide. Uh, in retirement, you're said to sit on a three-legged stool. Like I said, don't shoot the messenger. This is an old metaphor. And each leg of the stool represents three streams of income that people typically have in retirement. Number one is a pension. Number two is Social Security. Number three is what people do on their own, their 401k, their IRA, and things like that. Only 15% of the private sector have a pension today. I'm 35, you can't see me right now. My hairline does not look like that of a 35 year old, maybe a 50 year old. But I don't believe that I will have Social Security the way we know it to be today. And so not to stop being about you and your workforce, but this started being about me, the fact that I don't have a pension and I probably won't have Social Security the way I think. So the only leg of the retirement school that I personally have is what I do on my own. And this is really the essence of financial wellness is that, yeah, we don't want people to be unproductive, and we don't want people to deal with presenteeism and have stress-related health issues. But the reality is no one can ever retire unless people get their mind right around their financial life. And this doesn't mean, oh, well, that we just got to keep putting money in the 401k. No, 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 no. Here's what this means. This means you've got to learn a budget. You've got to learn how to get out of debt. You shouldn't buy a house if you can't buy a house. You shouldn't borrow money from family members or friends or loan money to family members or friends. Why? Because of the one leg of stool that is left. Now, if you happen to have an organization that has a pension, um, let's talk about that, that for a moment. Having someone in your workforce that is brought in to specifically discuss the lump sum option versus the annual payout option of your pension is beyond important. Here's what a vast majority of companies do. They hire investment advisors to come in for free with the hope that they can convert some of the audience to their, to their clientele. I can't emphasize enough, that is the worst possible thing you can do. The worst possible thing you can do. You should never subject your workforce in a financial workshop to someone that is the, the end game is not financial wellness. The end game is to add to their client base. And that's a major problem in my industry that we deal with right now, is that under the guise of free workshops, the bottom line comes back to something different is we're going to talk to the masses and give them a little uh, song and dance about budgeting, but the reality is we want the CEOs to roll over. Uh, and you need to be really careful about that. Don't get me wrong, I like free stuff too. I love it. Our junk drawer at home is filled with free stuff. Can koozies and flashlights and all the crap we all get at conventions. But I'll tell you, free financial wellness programming is a slippery slope. So if you're going to go down that road, just know and ask yourself, what is the end game? Is the end game financial wellness or is the end game client acquisition strategy from the people that are doing the financial wellness programming? important question to ask. And by the way, ring that uncomfortable bell again. An uncomfortable question to ask. By the end of this, you're like, I'm uncomfortable. Thank you. 
Uh, all right, so here's what I'm at. We're, we're, we're coming to an end. We finished up a little bit early, uh, but we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, but I think you get the gist of it here. Uh, you got to take action. I mean, you got to take action now and start with perking up your ears around the workforce, uh, the workplace. Do you hear positive financial conversations or negative? There's really no in between. I mean, what, what do you hear? Yeah, I like people to start conversations with coworkers. Here's my favorite. If you need, if you need to find, ask yourself this. Hey, you know what? I'm asking you this. If you needed five thousand dollars tomorrow, tomorrow, what's the plan? Here's what some of you are saying. Number one, you're saying, I've got it, no problem. I have five grand. Others are you saying, well, I guess I have to take a cash advance on my credit card. Others are saying I need to take a 401k loan. Others of you are saying I would borrow from my mom and dad. The answer to that question, there's only one good answer, right? It's if you have it. The other ones actually, this is what's crazy, the other answers to that question actually create complacency. If I'm comfortable knowing if I had a five thousand dollar emergency, that ah, I just do a cash advance on my credit card. That's that's a backup plan, but it's a terrible backup plan that creates complacency. Good financial wellness program fixes that. Here's what's nutty. The proper amount of an emergency fund to have for anyone listening to this call is three months worth of your expenses. Okay? Now, here's what's extra nutty about this. Let's say for you that's $15,000. If I say to you, you need $15,000, and the first thought you have is, wouldn't that be nice? That's a problem. That's a problem. Financial wellness needs to fix that. And I know this sounds kind of Oprah cosmic -y, you know, like, ooh, we were giving away cars and sending them to Australia. But I'll tell you, if, when you hear you need $15,000, you cannot possibly think. You cannot. I'm not allowing you to do it. You can't think, wouldn't that be nice? You've got to think, yeah, that's what I need. Because when you think, yeah, that's what I need, you're going to do it. When you think, wouldn't that be nice, then there, there's the expectation that you shouldn't have it or that there's no way you're going to get it. I told you it's over -ish. Sorry. She's lovely. Uh, number three, explore curriculum choices. There are a lot of curriculum choices, and there's actually some good ones, too. Um, you're going to see the differences between free and paid. You're going to see ones that have technical answers versus practical solutions. You're going to see some that have uh, overall costs versus per user costs. you got to see what's right for your organization. Um, and ultimately, I think you need to make sure that financial wellness is the end game. And you got to make it part of your culture. I mean, this is like anything else you, you all deal with on a regular basis. If your CEO and CFO and upper management, middle management don't care, then what's really the point? I mean, you can try to force change from the middle to bottom, uh, but it's really hard. It's a top-down thing. You know, when we do workshops and the CEO, I, I was speaking in Lexington, Kentucky, I think last Monday. My, my brain is scrambling based on travel last week, but I think it was last Monday in Lexington. It's a large credit union. That they had a so yeah it was last one because it was like Columbus Day or something right you know discover America allegedly and uh, so yeah, allegedly uh, so they had a the bank was closed the credit was closed so they had this huge workshop hundreds of people and they were doing a financial wellness event and the CEO was sitting in the front row like to me he wasn't walking around the back he wasn't dealing with other things that's engagement that's the sort of stuff you want and you know look I'm preaching to the choir you, of course you want your CEO to so uh, here's what it does, financial wellness in a nutshell, improves lives and decreases problems and it strengthens your business. Um, your financial issues are your client or your employees' financial issues. And their financial issues are your issues. You cannot separate them. If, you, if you're trying to separate them mentally, you're just your fingers are crossed. Your strategy is hoping that their financial issues do not cross over and hurt you in the workplace. There is no scenario where they do not. Absolutely not. So, uh, again, if we prefer financially well people, then just create them. Just create them. Uh, I think we can open it up to questions now, Kathy, that's all right. So, uh, what's the best thing for people? Just type in the side there. Yeah. Just in the questions or the chat feature. Um, I do have a question for you. Yeah. So, you mentioned that uh, financial wellness can't be nosy. So, how do we help our employees? How do we help them without asking those questions and seeming too nosy? What, what would you say is a good approach to doing that? There's a, a few different ways. And uh, I'm just going to tell you what we do. Again, okay. not for any other reason, sure. give an example. Uh, we do an anonymous survey before we come in that's anonymous and confidential that um, 
gets a, a feel of what's actually going on financially. Mm -hmm. Does your organization have a student loan problem? Does it have a credit card problem? Does it have um, you know, a lack of an emergency fund problem? So then the programming can be directed from there. And kind of the cool feature behind that, to, to put some proof in the pudding, is we, we re-measure after a year. So we're able to go to you and say, guess what? We just increased the net worth of the individuals within the organization by 20% this year. Any wellness program, as all of you know, is nearly impossible to measure, right? I mean, is that not the most frustrating? We all intrinsically know they're important and they work, but they're hard to measure. And so I think in our world, even the financial wellness world, that challenge exists too. Um, all the evaluations you get after workshops, they're glowing, they're fantastic and all, but I'd rather have hard numbers to say the net worth increase. Sure. So when we hire individuals, um, how can we help those people who don't necessarily know that they have a financial wellness issue or those people who don't want the help? What, what's a good way to go about that? That's a, that's a fantastic question, and I think that's the difference between technical and practical solutions. Um, if you go in and say, all right, everyone needs to budget, basically what you're saying is, hey, everybody here know math? Awesome. You're going to be okay financially. And, and that's, that's not legitimate. There needs to be uh, some vulnerability to the program to, 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 to not sit on a pedestal and, and shoot down financial information to the employees. You need people in the workplace. I think physical workshops are an important element, but not always necessary. Um, any financial wellness solution will have online options, will have paper options, and in-person in solutions. And ultimately, if it's good enough programming, the word gets around, and that's what you want. In any wellness programming, you want buzz, you want engagement, and that happens with good programming. If it's a, if it's a lame workshop that no one likes, you're going to figure that out real quick, and, and that will be the issue. Sure. Um, what about ste steps that you would suggest to start helping employees become well in their financial lives? What um, would you say the first step as an employer is? The first step, short of bringing in a financial wellness company to deal with it, I think just admitting that people in your workplace, including yourself, have issues that it's okay to talk about. Um, but you know, when you sh when you switch the frequency of pay, when you go from every two weeks to twice a month, that has a gigantic impact on people. Just know that a lot of the, the, the issues that just seem uh, administrative in nature that, that people do, that has a, a gigantic impact. I think encouraging the match and, and, uh, and the 401k you know, on a non-401k administrator level I think simply in your newsletter, I'm encouraging people to, let's say your match is 3%, just send out an email that says, hey, think of your salary for a second, multiply that by 3% and write that number down. And if you're not contributing to the 401k, uh, then tear up that piece of paper because that's what you're missing out on. And, and that's the harsh reality of that. I think also encouraging people to save their rates. Um, I think saving your raise is the smartest thing you can do for your financial life and for your retirement. If you think about it for a second, if you absorb in your lifestyle every single raise you ever have, which most of us do, most of us do, we're creating a dependency on our income every year until we retire. If at some point in time when you're in your 40s, you say, you know what, I'm making enough, so I'm going to save every raise I get. What you've actually started to do is to say to yourself, sure, my income's one level, but I don't need that. Now you're not going to your employer and saying, hey, keep the raise. You're just saving it. And it's not about accumulation at that point. Here's the trick. Here's, I'm going to give you a secret that I don't really tell audiences too often uh, on a situation like this. The key to retirement planning is very simple. It has nothing to do with accumulation. Now, if you're saving money, you have to save money. But it's not because you need to accumulate enough money to retire. You're saving money to break your dependency on your income. If you're saving 20% of your income, you're saying, I only need 80% to live on. And then if you save every raise after that, you're completely breaking your dependency on your income. So by the time you retire, which you often make a little bit less in retirement than the last year you worked, you're not so dependent on every single penny you make. And I think, you know, hearing that message for some of you that are maybe behind the retirement eight ball, a light went on your head. You're like, wow, I never really thought of it that way. If you take that to people that have been struggling with their financial lives in your workplace and something, a message that's like, well, hell, anybody can do that. I can save money. It's not about accumulation. Then I think that starts to connect the dots. Well, I think that wraps it up for us. Thanks so much, Pete, for all of your advice and expertise. 
Um, I hope all of the people who participated on the excuse me, webinar today um, have a greater understanding of how important financial wellness is um, to your employees and how it can cause so many different issues within the workplace. Um, as a reminder to all of our valued clients, PEATS available to you and your employees whenever you or your wellness team decide that the time is right to educate everyone about financial wellness. Um, and APEX is a, a partner in that as well. So let us know if you have questions. Um, Pete, thanks again for being here, and thanks everyone else. Have a great day.